there are some mistakes in the garden that you can recover from pretty quickly. There are some, however, that aren't quite so forgiving. In this video, I'm gonna go over seven garden planning mistakes so you don't make them yourself, or if you have, go over some ways to fix them. Coming up. Hey guys, I'm Brian with Next Level Gardening, and if you are looking to join an online garden community that offers tips, tricks, and support to help you take your garden to the next level, start now by clicking subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss anything. Now let's get growing. Now, by the way, if I thought of a mistake that you've made or you were just about to, let me know down in the comments. And if you think of a mistake that maybe you made or somebody else made that I didn't think of, let everyone know in the comments as well. So the first mistake you might make is the actual physical placement of your garden. And you, the most important thing probably is sun exposure. You want a minimum of six hours of full sun on your garden, with eight or more being optimal. Now you can look behind me right here and what you're seeing is the winter garden. In the winter, my garden only gets about four hours, at least on this side, only gets about four hours of direct sunlight a day. Now the brassicas don't seem to mind, and there are a few shade plants uh, or plants that tolerate shade. That doesn't mean they're gonna be their best, it just means they'll deal with it. And you always wanna know where the sun is on your garden space in the summer and in the winter, because in the summer, this entire area gets eight or more hours of full sun. But in the winter, when the sun sinks toward the horizon, we've got two palm trees up here that shade out the space. And then over on that side, the actual fence just shades out the space. So you want to pay attention to structures and, and vegetation that might shade your garden. Not improving your soil is a huge mistake. Maybe one of the biggest. Now I presented a wealth of information on soil, soil types, soil structure, uh, pH of the soil, all of that is included in the very first Organic Gardening Basics series, which was three Saturdays ago. I'll link that down below and you'll know every, everything you need to know to make your soil better. But as the old saying goes, it's better to plant a $1 plant in a $10 hole than a $10 plant in a $1 hole. The soil is literally the foundation of your garden for healthy plants. You have to take the time and the energy before you get started to really amend that garden soil with tons of organic matter. And for organic matter, we're talking about compost, um, well rotted manure, manure that is completely broke, broken down and composted in and of itself. It builds the structure of the soil, it feeds uh, microscopic life in the soil, and it holds on to moisture. And if you do that, you will never be sorry. If you don't do that, you're gonna regret it very soon. If you have soil that is contaminated or that is really heavy clay or really uh, almost well too well draining uh, sand, it's really sandy, then you may need to go into raised beds. If your garden is within 50 feet of a black walnut tree, you're gonna need to grow in raised beds. The roots of black walnut trees secrete a substance called juglone that is a toxin to a lot of plants. Now the plants that will absolutely not grow under a black walnut tree, and we're talking within about a 50 foot radius from the trunk. So if you have your garden in that area, you definitely cannot grow the, the uh, cabbages, you cannot grow the nightshades, which is tomato, eggplant, peppers, and potatoes. And all the other plants, they will tolerate the black walnut, the juglone from the black walnut. They will not thrive possibly in that. So if you have a black walnut tree and you're within 50 uh, feet of the radius of that trunk, raised beds are gonna be your best bet. The third mistake you might make is making your beds too wide. And I'm not talking about just raised beds, even in ground beds. If they are too wide, you're going to need to step into them to cultivate, to harvest, to plant. Anything you need to do, you're gonna to need to get into those beds. And that's gonna 
compact the soil. You don't want that. A good rule of thumb is to not make your beds any wider than four feet. That allows you to be able to reach to the middle from both sides and not get into your beds. The fourth mistake is making your beds too short. If you are growing in raised beds, you want to make sure they're tall enough for your situation. Now, if you are putting your raised beds on top of soil that's not contaminated, or maybe on top of lawn that is not an invasive type of lawn that grows through runners, then six inches is perfect. It doesn't need to be any deeper than that. Now, the deeper the better, but you can get by with six inches. If you are growing on a uh, invasive type of lawn, if you are growing on uh, concrete, then you want to have a minimum of 12 inches of depth, 24 being really great. Um, but that will give enough root run on top of that impenetrable surface. Now, if you have contaminated soil that you're building your raised beds on top of, you're going to need a uh, layer of plastic or something in between the soil on the ground that's contaminated and the soil you're filling your bed with. Before we get to number five, if you've learned anything in this video so far, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and maybe even sharing it with a friend. It definitely helps the video out. The fifth mistake is not giving enough forethought to the paths in your garden, both the width and what they're made out of. Now, in terms of width, the least I would want to have is two feet. These two beds are exactly two feet apart. And I'm kind of tall and I can barely sit to the side on my knees, kneeling down to work in the beds uh, and literally knee to foot there's barely enough room. If I had enough space here, I would have done three feet between the beds. So if you have the ability to do that, I would highly recommend it. My rake and my broom are actually wider than these beds are apart. So you might wanna think about that. If you use a wheelbarrow or a wheelchair, you wanna make sure that the paths and the turns are well thought out in advance. If you live in a wet climate, you want to make sure your paths are composed of something that is not going to get muddy in the rain. Otherwise, it's going to inhibit you from being able to go out in the garden whenever you need to, if you need to harvest or do whatever you need to do after it's been raining. I live in a dry climate, pretty dry, and I this used to be a cement slab here. And unfortunately, it was, you know, durable, obviously, but it was stained, it was cracked, it was old, there were weeds growing through the cracks, and it just didn't look all that great. And so this past summer, we actually uh, put down a three inch layer of decomposed granite. It's available in almost every area and it comes in different colors depending on what the mountains are made from near you. So we covered this slab with the decomposed granite after laying down weed cloth over those weedy cracks. And I really love the natural look that it gives, but it's very tidy also. The sixth mistake is overcrowding your plants. It's really easy to do, especially when packets of seeds come with so many seeds. I used to sow them all knowing full well out of the hundred seeds, I only had room for 10 plants. I don't know why I did it, but I know I'm not alone, right? Anyway, even if you have a thousand pepper plants, and they're all really cute and small and they only take up one square inch of soil, you know when they get full grown, they're gonna be much bigger than that. Unless you put the peppers out when it's still cold outside and then they're probably not gonna get much bigger. You also won't get any peppers. If you're growing in raised beds though, here's the good news. In raised beds, you can plant more intensively, which means you can plant things closer together than in the ground. Because they have a very deep root run that is very aerated, they can grow closer together and their roots don't compete for all the nutrients in the space. Now, if you have or haven't heard of square foot gardening, just Google that and that's gonna give you the spacing of how many plants you can grow in a square foot of space in a well-amended raised bed. Okay, the seventh mistake that you can make, I make it plenty, however, I am working on it, is monocropping. I'm going to be starting a series in late March or early April um, about companion planting. 
Now, if you scroll through Pinterest, you're gonna see thousands of charts and diagrams on what to plant with what, which plants like which plants, and most of it is probably nonsense. In doing a series on companion planting, I wanted to not do a series if that's all it was. I wanted my series to be companion plants that are scientifically proven, and if not scientifically proven, they have enough anecdotal evidence to support the use of that type of companion planting. So I've been doing my research and I'm gonna continue doing my research and my garden this year is going to be much more diverse than it ever has been before. Last year, I really started companion planting more than I ever had before and I really had a much better season in terms of pests and disease than I think I've ever had before. But the one thing that anybody talking about companion plants will agree on is polyculture versus monoculture. Monoculture is what the big farms use, traditional farms, uh, big ag. You know, you have, as far as the eye can see, fields of corn or wheat or whatever. It's all one thing. When you plant that way, you are almost always going to be reliant on some sort of pesticide. Big ag, hey, they don't mind. It's chemicals, right? But in our garden, that's why we're growing our own food. So we don't have to do that kind of thing. And even though there are organic solutions like neem oil and BT that I love, I would love to not even have to use those. Not just because it can possibly harm beneficials if not used correctly, but just the hassle of having to go out to your garden on a daily basis, which you should be doing, and just strolling around to see if the aphids are attacking or if the white fly are here. That is a lot of work. And then to get out the, the sprayer and mix everything up and then go around and spray. Well, you know what polyculture does? It is planting not just one bed of cabbages or one bed of tomatoes. It is intercropping with other plants, multiple different kinds, and it confuses the bad bugs. Because if you have an entire bed of one thing, this bug can see that a mile away. But if you've got a cabbage that's mixed in with this and that and the other thing, it confuses them. And so it's harder for them to find. So that's just one aspect of it, but it's a huge mistake in going forward. I will not be monocropping ever again. And I suggest that you plan ahead and just plant more variety of things in each space. So hopefully these seven mistakes are not ones that you have made, and if so, hopefully there's an easy remedy that you found here to fix them quickly. I'll see you guys next time.